Hello and welcome to uh, the second lecture of George Orwell's essay Shooting an Elephant. So we started this uh, in the previous lecture, this particular essay by Orwell, and we looked at how uh, things like race, identity, uh, politics, obviously political location, political condition, uh, they all inform uh, gendered identity, gendered behavior, and they create or generate a certain economy of expectations around a certain kind of gendered identity. Uh, so we talked about how the expectation from a white man in a, non in a, in a colonial space uh, is quite different from the expectation of a, from a Burmese person in Burma, which, is, which happens to be colonized. So we looked at how, uh, paradoxically, the crisis of agency in Orwell's essay uh, seems to be born out of being powerful. And this is interesting because you know we talked about in the previous lecture how crisis of agency or agentic crisis of voicelessness, the fact that you can't speak. Uh, these are things, these are conditions which we normally associate with powerlessness. So somebody in a marginalized position, uh, you know, somebody marginalized because of his or her uh, gender, race, religion, etc. But the important thing about Orwell's essay, and this is the reason why we study it so heavily in gender studies, uh, is the fact that it seems to suggest that the entire crisis of agency, the fact that you can't do what you really want to do, that happens because you are powerful, right? So this paradoxical production of a crisis is something which we look at in Orwell's essay and something which we'll uh, you know, delve deep into as we move on. Now we had seen, th the point where we stopped in the previous lecture was the point where there was a description of an event and we looked at the definition of event in this particular context, uh, the theoretical definition of event, the philosophical definition of event as something which changes, which brings about ontological and epistemological change. Right? It changes things uh, at a level of materiality, uh, but equally uh, it changes things at a level of knowledge. So your perception of life changes post the event, your perspective on life changes post the event. Right? And this perspectival change, this epistemological change is something which happens in George Orwell's essay Shooting an Elephant. So post the event, post the shooting of the elephant, his idea of his identity, his idea of his gendered identity changes dramatically and permanently. And this is what the essay is all about. And he realizes that you know, his entire identity is a performative one. You know, being a white man in colonial Burma is a performative condition, is a performative experience, is a performative state of being. It's something which you have to do endlessly ad infinitum. Right? And the moment you stop it, you can't stop it. The moment you stop it, the entire machinery, the entire narrative of domination, the entire narrative of the white man's supremacy, the entire narrative of imperialism will collapse and that will not collapse, that cannot collapse, right? And that's something which must go on. So the, the possibility of human intervention is minimal in this kind of a condition. As a human being, you cannot intervene, you cannot change. So you're less a human being and more an identity, more an image. <clears throat> So in other words, uh, we talked about in the last lecture about two different orders of embodiment and uh, what's interesting is how the, uh, the core order of embodiment, the human order of embodiment, the emotional, human, neural order of embodiment, the existential order of embodiment, that becomes secondary uh, in comparison to the political extended order of embodiment which takes primacy in this particular case. Okay. So we'll continue with the essay and we'll look at how uh, this particular even shooting elephant, it brings about certain dramatic changes in Orwell's uh, perspective on power. Okay, so uh, this is a state, this is a, the, the, the section where he goes out. Uh, so we, we saw in the previous lecture, uh, the point where we stopped is where he got out of the police station, uh, got on a horse, uh, took a little rifle, uh, you know, primarily to sh shoo away, scare away the elephant if need be. Uh, and then he sort of found out uh, what happened, what the elephant had done. So we, we get to know through the narrator that the elephant is actually a tame elephant, but it had got momentarily mad uh, because of a seasonal amorous uh, experience that, it, that, that, that comes to every uh, elephant. And as a result of which, uh, he had broken away from uh, the chains, he had escaped the chains, and it has become a bit of a wild elephant at the moment. Uh, and it sort of come to the bazaar and had done certain things which are worrying. Uh, so he killed a cow. Uh, eaten up the food stock from a, um, a fruit seller, uh, you know, completely ravaged a municipal van, uh, a, you know, a trash van, and obviously the, the van driver had to run away, etc. In other words, it's become a nuisance. It's become a bit of a problem, you know, a rogue elephant, uh, if you can use the term. And, it's, uh, and like you said at the, at the last lecture, the moment something non-normative happens, 
is the person summoned to control it uh, is the embodiment of normativity, the embodiment of established normativity, the embodiment of establishment. And who is the person? The white police officer in a colonial space, who happens to be the man George Orwell. But the man George Orwell may not want to have anything to do with all this. But that's completely beside the point. That's not something that he has the option to avail. Uh, so he cannot say that I don't want to do this. And you know, that's what we get to know as we read this particular essay. So if you look at this slide, the next slide which is on your screen, where he says, as it started forward, practically the whole population of the, of the quarter flocked out of the houses and followed me. They had seen the rifle and were all shouting excitedly that I was going, uh, you know, also excited that I was going to shoot the elephant. They had not shown much interest in the elephant when he was merely ravaging the homes, but it was not different that he was going to be shot. It was a bit of a fun to them, as it would be to an English crowd. Besides, they wanted the meat. So, the image what we have over here is a classic Pied Piper image. You know, the controller, someone with a you know, magic instrument, uh, which in this particular case happens to be the rifle. So, uh, he gets on a pony, walks, sort of rides down the town, an entire population of the town flocks behind him in a Pied Piper kind of an image. If you remember uh, the Pied Piper of Hamilton story, which we read when we were children, uh, so the Pied Piper is a controller of rats. So, it's a, it's a town of Hamilton is infested with rats and the Pied Piper comes from somewhere and is given the responsibility to control it and he wants to control it, so he goes on and all the mice go after him. Uh, and that's how we control it. But that, that kind of a graphic visual image uh, is replicated uh, in this particular section. Now, the point, the other point he's making over here is interesting. He says that this is going to be a bit of a fun for the Burmese crowd, as it would be to an English crowd. Uh, but the point is, it's going to be more fun to the Burmese crowd because they're going to see the white man doing some kind of a uh, miracle, you know, a white man killing the elephant with a gun. And that's something they, 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 they can't do. And, and it was mentioned earlier uh, in, the previous, uh, in the slide which we played in the previous lecture, where it was clearly indicated that these are people, this Burmese population, they are unarmed. They don't have weapons, uh, or to, uh, at, any, at any rate, any sophisticated weapon with which they can control or address or shoot the elephant. So they're completely dependent on the white man and his gun, uh, and his efficiency with the gun uh, to you know, scare the elephant away or you know, to shoot him uh, if need be. Uh, now, the entire population of this particular Burmese town uh, is running after Orwell uh, with the expectation that a white man is about to do uh, a performative act. And this is interesting. This is the point where I'm going to do a little bit before I move on. So, the expectation which is building uh, you know, in this particular scene and throughout the rest of the uh, essay, as we'll see, is the expectation of the white hegemonic male to be performative. In other words, to perform his hegemony to perform his gendered hegemony, right? to be the white man, uh, to do the act which becomes the white man, uh, to fulfill the textuality of what constitutes the white man. And in this particular case, the performativity is shooting the elephant. Now, it's going to be uh, a spectacular act. As you can see, a, a spectacle is beginning to form already. There's an audience uh, which is eager to consume this act already. Uh, it's, it's flocking after him, it's running after him with the expectation that this is going to happen, the, the, the elephant is going to be shot and you know, with the shooting of the elephant, they're going to have a bit of fun and of course, there's a more pragmatic reason why they're flocking behind him. Uh, they might want to have the meat of the elephant, they might want to you know, take off the meat and, and consume it, uh, it's edible to them. So, there are two different kinds of consumption uh, being anticipated away. One is the visual consumption, uh, the collective visual consumption. Uh, where, whereby the Burmese people want to see the, you know, the white man shoot the elephant and that's going to visually uh, you know, be, be, be interesting for them because uh, it's going to uh, completely play up, it's completely fit into the image of the white man. That's what is expected of the white man. This, this degree of performativity, this quality of performativity is something which is expected of the white man and that's something which they want to consume. And equally, at a more uh, visceral embodied level, they want to consume the meat of the elephant. So, there are two different orders of consumption at play over here. Okay? So, if you just come back to the slide, uh, which was on the screen, uh, it sort of says it was a bit of fun to them as it would be to an English crowd besides they wanted the meat. It made me vaguely uneasy. So, obviously, he's un understanding that this is about to happen. Uh, the people behind them, they want him to shoot the elephant uh, that's making him uneasy. I had no intention of shooting the elephant. I had merely sent for the rifle to defend myself in the accessory and it is always unnerving to have a crowd following you. Now, this is the beginning of the neurosis that, you know, he is Obviously, as a human being, he's uneasy, he's, he's 
you know, he's scared. He's not something, you know, he's not looking forward to shooting the elephant. He did not intend to shoot the elephant. In other words, he says quite clearly, I had no intention of shooting the elephant. And this is the point where the question of agency comes in. Right? What does he want to do? Does he want to shoot the elephant? Does he want to uh, really kill the elephant? He, he says quite clearly and unequivocally that it does not. He does not want to shoot the elephant. But what happens subsequently, it was begin to happen already as you read this passage, is a, a, a generation of a, a collective economy of expectation, right? uh, which is coming out of the Burmese people. Because they, they see the white man uh, you know, ride down the street with a, in a pony with a gun. And the automatic assumption, the expectation is that a white man will do a performative thing and will shoot the elephant. And that collective will, that collective agency, the collective desire uh, or the will, uh, it sort of overrides the personal will and agency of the man George Orwell. The man George Orwell is less important over here than a white man George Orwell. Right? In other words, again, look at the way how, in which how race and gender are related. As, at, at the beginning of this course, we, we talked about how gender is not an isolated phenomenon. It's never an isolated phenomenon. Gender is something which never operates in isolation. It's something which is deeply embedded and enmeshed with other factors like race, uh, cultural capital, financial capital, political condition, etc. So all these different material conditions and abstract conditions, they all come together to create uh, the identity of gender or the ontology of gender, which is obviously mutable. It can change because you know, if the apparatus around you changes, your location of gender, your location in gender will also change. So you know, we talked about this theoretically at the beginning of this course, if you remember, and if you brush up uh, your previous lecture notes. Now over here, what we find is his entire gendered identity is deeply and immediately informed by his racial identity. So he's a white man. It's not just a normal man. He's a white man. And because he's a white man in a colonial space, he's automatically expected to shoot the elephant. And there's a collective will building up behind him, which sort of pushes him towards doing that. And he says quite clearly over here, I do not want, I had no intention of shooting the elephant. My original intention of sending for the gun was to scare away a crowd or scare away an elephant if necessary. But I had not even contemplated shooting the elephant. It's something which is beginning to happen. It's, it's making me uneasy. So are these people expecting that I shoot the elephant? Because I did not want to in the beginning. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, it is always unnerving to have a crowd following you. So there's a crowd following him and he's sort of realizing it. I marched down the hill looking and feeling a fool with a rifle over my shoulder and, my, and an ever-growing army of people jostling at my heels. At the bottom, when he got away from the huts, there was a metal road and beyond that a, a miry waste of paddy fields a thousand yards across, not yet ploughed but soggy from the first rains and dotted with coarse grass. The elephant was standing eight yards from the road, his left side towards us. He took not the slightest notice of the crowd's approach. He was tearing up bunches of grass, beating them against his knees to clean them and stuffing them into his mouth. So uh, the word fool appears many times in this essay and this is the first time where uh, it does. So he says, I, I'm, I'm feeling like a fool because you know, on the one hand, I know I'm scared. I know I have no intention of shooting the elephant. I know that this is something I don't want to do. Right? But at the same time, I also know there is an ever-growing army of people behind him. And you know, corresponding to it, associated with it, is an ever-growing economy of expectation, which is growing behind me. And that expectation, that army of people, the will of those people collectively, will override my individual personal will and its associated agency. Despite the fact that I am notionally or theoretically the powerful person over here. So you begin to get the paradox in this essay, right? So he is technically the powerful person over here because he's a white man in colonial Burma. So, you know, politically, technically, culturally, financially, in every which sense, he is a powerful person. But ironically, it is this being the powerful person, this state of being the powerful person, which makes him powerless because, you know, because he's powerful, certain acts are expected of him. Certain performative acts are expected of him. And this is one of these acts that he, the white man, must be in control of a mob, must be in control of any potential anarchy. And this elephant has become an embodiment of anarchy. So it's but natural, but normal that a white man with a rifle would go down the street and shoot the elephant like a crack shot and will not miss the aim. And this is the collective expectation of the crowd uh, behind him. 
which has nothing to do with his individual intention or agency. That's something which we begin to get at this point. The paradox is building up. So this is the point where the paradox begins to happen, the production of the paradox, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of this lecture. Now, uh, what he's saying is, I'm, I'm feeling like a fool. Uh, I know I don't want to do something, but I'm marching down the streets with the people marching behind me uh, as if I'm some kind of a hero, a savior, but whereas in reality, I am very much a fool because I am being forced into doing something I do not want to do. Right? And this is the crisis of agency, the classic crisis of agency, which comes up in shooting an elephant. Right? So, what we can see and say at this level, at this point, because uh, you know, we sort of we're looking at it as a literary text and we're trying to decode it, we're trying to unpack the metaphors away up, and we're reading it as a literary text, is the elephant or the act of shooting the elephant becomes the metaphorical act. And what does it metaphorize? What, what, what does it stand for as a metaphor? It stands for Orwell's own agency. So shooting the elephant becomes symbolically shooting or annihilating Orwell's own human agency. So it's, it becomes symbolically an annihilation of his agency. And interestingly, this annihilation of agency is ironically produced due to his gendered location. The gender, the ratio gendered location as I mentioned, because race and gender are completely related over here. So if you have been a white woman uh, in this particular situation, no one would expect a white woman to go up in the streets and shoot the elephant. And if a white woman could do it, that would be an aberration. That would be a break from the normative narrative. But for, for a white man who happens to be a colonial officer, uh, a police officer uh, to boot, uh, that particular person is automatically expected to shoot an elephant or anything which can cause any disturbance in normativity, any disturbance in a normative narrative. So Orwell over here is but enacting the role of a white person, a white police officer. Right? So the whiteness and the manliness are connected together in a way which becomes a very complex category of identity uh, which becomes so important and so powerful that his human will and agency become increasingly powerless. And this is what the essay begins to dramatize away. Now when it looks at the elephant, uh, as you see in this particular passage, when it looks at the elephant, the elephant seems to be completely isolated, doesn't really you know, pay any attention to the crowd of army, the crowd of people coming towards it. And he's just eating his grass very, very, in a very docile fashion. Uh, so it doesn't look wild at all. It doesn't look as if he's, he ought to be shot. Right? It doesn't look as if he is someone, uh, you know, the elephant is someone who is potentially dangerous or damaging, etc. So it had had a certain experience, uh, you know, a certain hormonal experience out of which it became wild temporarily. Um, there is a passage in, at the beginning which I did not play, uh, where there's a description of how the elephant had killed uh, a coolie, uh, you know, sort of trampled on him, uh, perhaps accidentally, we never know, but the fact is the man died. And, and it's very grotesque kind of an image which is given uh, in this particular essay, which uh, forced Orwell to go back uh, and get a bigger rifle, uh, which prompted him to shoot the elephant, right? But, you know, as a backup plan, but he never really intended primarily to shoot the elephant. That particular intention was never there. But now he, he realizes that expectation is building behind him and he has no other option apart from shooting the elephant. And as you can sort of see how that happens in due course. This is a section where uh, the entire the crisis of agency is beginning to happen. And it says, as soon as I saw the elephant, I knew with perfect certainty that I ought not to shoot him. He knows, it's completely certain to him that you know, the elephant you know, doesn't need to be shot. It's a serious matter to shoot a walking elephant. It is comparable to destroying a huge and costly piece of machinery. And obviously, one ought not to do it if it can possibly be avoided. And at that distance, peacefully eating, the elephant looked no more dangerous than a cow. I thought then, and I think now, that his attack of must was already passing off, in which case he would merely wander harmlessly about until the mahout came back and caught him. Moreover, I do not in the least want to shoot him. I decided that I would watch him for a little while to make sure that he did not turn savage again and then go home. So this is the original intention. So when he sees the elephant, uh, his original intention is corroborated, is consolidated. So he sees the elephant and realizes this elephant is completely harmless now. So this entire attack, this hormonal attack which had come, seized him, uh, had gone away. So now it doesn't look any more dangerous than a cow. 
Uh, and obviously, uh, the metaphor of the cow is used to domesticate the, the elephant. Again, this is a bit of a literary reading we should do. We should be very careful to us reading metaphors because remember, uh, metaphors are things uh, which suggest certain things. Right? These are words which are there for a particular reason, for a particular strategic semiotic reason. Right? It wants to tell you something. And the word cow over here obviously indicates that elephant is uh, quite harmless now and there's no point shooting the elephant. So, it's absurd to think of the elephant as a wild animal at this stage. So, he knows, he says that, you know, when I looked at the elephant, uh, I realized at that moment and I do realize it now that the entire uh, attack of must is going away and now it's completely harmless. He's just waiting for the mahout to come back and as soon as the mahout comes back, it will just go away with the mahout. So, he says, uh, I decided to stand there uh, and wait and watch for a little while to make sure it did not turn savage again and then I will just go home. So, this is the original human intention that the man George Orwell has, that I am just going to stand there, watch the elephant, uh, make sure it does not turn savage again, make sure it does not turn wild again and then I will go back and go home. Right? And this is what, you, what I want to do, this is what my agentic self wants to do. Right? So, this is the point where we pause and then we move on and see what he has to do instead. Right? So, if you look at the next slide, this is the classic uh, description of the lack of agency which comes out of being powerful. Right? And I said that again, this is a classic example of a lack of agency or a crisis of agency which emerges from being powerful. Okay? And that sounds paradoxical, but it is a paradoxical production of crisis of agency. Okay, and this is what he says. But at that moment, I glanced around at the crowd that had followed me. It was an immense crowd, 2,000 at the least and growing every minute. It blocked the road for a long distance on either side. I looked at a sea of yellow faces above the garish clothes, faces all happy and excited over this bit of fun, all certain that elephant was going to be shot. They were watching me as they would watch a conjurer about to perform a trick. They did not like me. But with a magical rifle in my hands, I was momentarily worth watching. And suddenly I realized that I should have to shoot the elephant after all. The people expected it of me, and I had got to do it. I could feel the 2,000 wheels pressing me forward irresistibly. So, this is the point in the essay where the entire uh, idea of agency changes, the entire idea of uh, who has agency begins to shift. So, originally when the essay began, you know, the, the point where the essay began, we would have said, oh, this is colonial Burma, this is where the British torture, exploit the Burmese people, you know, take away all the natural resources, uh, you know, it is a complete act of financial exploitation. So, obviously, the British people have agency and the Burmese people do not, which is theoretically and historically and politically correct. But this particular event, and it was, again, I use the word event uh, very, very philosophically and theoretically over here, is an event which changes uh, the entire ontology uh, of power over here, the entire understanding of power over here. And this particular event uh, completely problematizes the way uh, the powerful and the powerless uh, are located. So, suddenly, the notionally powerless people, the notionally powerless population, they begin to get powerful. And the notionally powerful figure uh, protagonist begin to get, begins to get powerless. And this is what happens in this particular section of this essay, where he says, I look back and suddenly there are 2000 people behind me. And when I look back and saw the yellow faces and the garish clothes, again, it is very racist, from the, the metaphors he is using, but again, it is politically very, very incorrect and hence is significant to us today uh, as a, in a human being. How is he looking at the people behind him? He is not trying to be politically correct, he is not trying to be safe. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely not safe. It's very unsafe. But he looks back uh, and gives a very unsafe, unsavory description of the Burmese people uh, and tells you exactly how we felt at that point of time. And he says that, you know, I could see they watching me and I could see the will rising every second, the irresistible collective will of 2000 Burmese people uh, behind me pushing me forward uh, to shoot the elephant. And they were, they were watching me as if they would watch a conjurer about to perform a trick. And this is so important, a conjurer about to perform a trick. So, we talked about performativity and uh, this is something uh, written by a man who knew nothing about performativity, nothing about gender studies, nothing about the theoretical apparatus which we use today in gender studies. But look and observe how fascinatingly applicable and relevant this is uh, in our understanding of gender today. So, he is a white man with a gun 
and that makes them the hypermasculine person in that particular space. And because he is a hypermasculine person in that particular space, by dint of his race, by dint of his gender location, by dint of his machinery around him, he is supposed to be the conjurer controlling any anarchy. So his act of shooting the elephant is a profoundly performative act. It's something he has to do performatively. It, it is meant to be a spectacle. There is already an audience which has been prepared, which is gathered to, to consume the event, to consume this performative act and the performativity which he must carry out at this point. He must never, he cannot go back at this point without shooting the elephant. And that's the whole point that the essay is making. That you know, Despite his intention, despite his will not to shoot the elephant, which he says unequivocally you know, in several occasions, I don't want to shoot the elephant. My original intention was not to shoot the elephant. I'm scared to shoot the elephant. And then uh, when I watch the elephant, I realize it's perfectly harmless. It will be completely criminal to shoot the elephant. It is useless to shoot the elephant, unnecessary. He says all this. But then he turns back and then realizes 2,000 Burmese people are waiting uh, with bated breath for him, the white man, the Sahib, to shoot the elephant uh, you know, and create this performative act. And he realizes there's no going back from here. He has to shoot the elephant against his own will. So the whole thing begins to get uh, turned upside down, as you can see. The notionally powerful white man becomes a powerless puppet over here. Uh, you know, at the hands of the uh, notionally powerless Burmese people who are basically pushing him towards doing an act which he does not want to do. Okay? Right. So the next slide will show you, this is uh, the first, there was a description of the event and now there's a philosophy which he realized, the knowledge that he realizes and that's, a, that's the reason why he used an event philosophically because certain changes happen during this event at the level of knowledge. It's not just about him with a gun shooting an animal. Beneath this materiality, there is something epistemological which is changing, uh, something on the level of knowledge which is changing. Uh, and hence, it's, it's, it's an event of change in a philosophical sense. And this is what he says uh, in a beautifully moving way, which is also disturbing at the same time. And he says, it was at this moment, as I stood there with a the rifle in my hands, that I first grasped the hollowness the futility of the white man's domination or dominion in the East. Here was I, the white man with his gun, standing in front of the unarmed native crowd, seemingly the leading actor of the piece. But in reality, I was only an absurd puppet, pushed to and fro by the will of these yellow faces behind. I perceived in this moment that when the white man turns tyrant, it is his own freedom that he destroys. He becomes a sort of a hollow, posing dummy. The conventionalized figure of a sahib, but it is the condition of his rule that he shall spend his life trying, trying to impress the natives. And so in every crisis, he has got to do what the natives expect of him. He wears a mask and his face grows to fit it. I had got to shoot the elephant. I had committed myself to doing it when I sent for the rifle. Okay? So this is really important. If you look at the metaphors in this passage, uh, there's, an, there's an image of an actor, first of all. Uh, there is an image of a dummy. Right? So there's a dummy, there's an actor, uh, there's also, you know, he says, I'm wearing a mask, etc. So all these metaphors taken together, you know, really point to one thing. The artificial performative act which he's supposed to carry out at this moment. So he's a leading actor in a piece. So it's a narrative, right? It's a plot which is already always there, right? And I say that again, it's a plot which is already always there. And all he has to do, all he can do, is play his little role in the plot. And the little role that he has is that of a white man shooting the elephant. And it's not so much about the real shooting the elephant, it's more of a symbolic act. And the act must be done, the act must be performed in order to preserve the plot. The plot of power, the plot of imperialism, the plot of uh, gendered narratives, the plot of gendered knowledge, the plot of racial knowledge, the plot of everything. It's, it's a huge massive plot. And he, as a man, cannot do anything to intervene it. It's a monstrous plot of power, right? And he's just a character in the plot, and he must carry out what is desired of him, what is expected of him. And what is expected of him is that he shoots the elephant, because that is what the performative act that a white man must do in a situation like this. So he can't turn his back and say, I'm not going to shoot the elephant, I'm going to walk back and have my cup of tea, and the elephant will go away, because there's no need to shoot the elephant. This is something which goes beyond need. So if you just go back to what we discussed about performativity, you can see this classically constitutes performativity. There's no need to shoot the elephant. So it's beyond need. So it's excessive, one. Okay? 
It's spectacular too. So there's a spectacle around them. There, there are people, there are 2,000 Burmese people who are waiting with bated breath uh, to uh, sh see him shoot the elephant, to see the Sahib shoot the elephant. Th they will consume it visually. It will be a larger than life event. So it's excessive, it's unnecessary, it's spectacular, and also largely it's dramatic. So we have the theater metaphor over here. Uh, so he says, I wear a mask. Uh, he wears a mask and his face goes to fit it. So the, the mask metaphor way uh, obviously means he's an actor. He's acting out something artificially. It's not his face, right? Uh, his own original organic face must grow to fit the mask. So that itself shows you that the organic order of embodiment, the corporeal neural core order of embodiment is less important over here than the artificial extended order of embodiment. If, if you look at the mask as an extension of the face, right? So, you know, I have a face and then I wear a mask when I go out, uh, you know, when I socialize. So if you look at a symbol of the mask, it's some kind of a symbolic uh, extension of who I am, right? Uh, in this particular case, the symbolic extension becomes more powerful. It's the all powerful thing. You know, no one really cares about the face. No one's asking him from the crowd that, do you want to shoot the elephant? That is completely irrelevant. Uh, it's what the mask should do. That becomes the only relevant issue in this particular situation, right? So he says, I, I'm, the Sahib becomes sort of a hollow posing dummy. He's a poser. He's a poser for power. He poses power all the time. So when a white man turns tyrant in the East, it is his own freedom that he destroys, right? He becomes a dummy because then he has to keep repeating that code of violence, the code of domination, the code of exploitation, uh, the, the plot will be produced. Uh, out of these codes, and he must go on preserving this plot ad infinitum, right? There's no way out. He must go on preserving this plot. He must go on producing and preserving this plot, right? So the entire act becomes an act of preservation, preservation of the plot of power. And power over here is more powerful than a powerful man. So his powerful gendered identity is completely redundant and powerless compared to the macro narrative of power. You know, the meta narrative of power, the larger narrative of power, that is more important. So he becomes a bit of a, a leading actor of a piece. Right? So the word actor, the word dummy, the word mask, the word hollow pose and dummy, the, web, the word, you know, the fact that he's wearing a mask. So all these things come together and basically really hammer home the point that this is completely an artificially performative act. And this is a kind of culture, this is a kind of political condition where art, this degree of artificiality is celebrated, produced and promoted at the cost of human agency. So the human agency is irrelevant over here. Okay? So he says, I'm feeling like a dummy and the word fool had come before, the word dummy comes down. In other words, his own human agency is completely liquidated, you know, it's completely gone, it doesn't, it's not there. So even if it's there at a residual level inside him, he cannot extend it. So his core neural mechanism of embodiment is all the embodiment that is available to him at this point of time, uh, but uh, he, you know, that he cannot enact it, right? So the artificial order of embodiment is not something he wants to do, it's not something he can connect to, but he has to do it. And the artificial order of embodiment is the embodiment that he must enact as a white sahib not as a man, George Orwell, but as a white Sahib. You know, it's nameless, faceless, any white man would do at this point, right? So his agency is completely gone. It's a complete invasion of agency. Uh, paradoxically, and I say it again, paradoxically, because this, is, this comes out of power. This comes out of being powerful, not because it's powerless, but because it's politically and technically and theoretically powerful. And this being theoretically powerful is something which makes him paradoxically powerless in this condition. So this is what makes this entire essay a very compelling piece. Uh, if you're looking at gender, agency, identity, and how these three things, these, these things sort of inform each other, but also, uh, you know, deconstruct one another uh, in certain social and political conditions. Okay? So, and this is the second bit, this is, you know, when he goes on philosophizing, when he so sort of really tells you, describes to you the performative nature of being a sahib. Uh, so what, what constitutes a sahib uh, in a colonial space? This endless mimicry of being a sahib. So uh, the word mimicry is used in colonial studies and post-colonial studies uh, largely and dominantly uh, to talk about how the colonized subject wants to aspire, aspires to become the colonizer and produces an alternative image 
which is never the same image, but an image with a difference. And this constitutes the process of mimicry, when uh, the colonized subject wants to mimic the colonizer and ends up producing a different image, an excessive image, an inadequate image, uh, a different image. But the mimicry over here is different. The mimicry is, is sort of more, uh, sort of less complicated, but at the same time more complex. Because there's a white man who is trying to mimic the code of the white man. So it's not as if uh, he's a Burmese person wanting to be a Sahib. It's a white man, a biological white man, a human being who wants, who's desperately trying uh, to fit into the code of the white Sahib going against his will. So his own will uh, is not corresponding, is not in sync with the, uh, you know, the performative quality of being a white man. But he's putting his will aside and then trying to uh, subscribe to the larger narrative of being a white sahib. So he says, a sahib has got to act like a sahib. He has got to appear resolute, to know his own mind and do definite things. So, you know, being resolute, to know your mind, to be rational, to be in control of everything, that constitutes the construct of the sahib. And I use the word construct over here, and I hope you know uh, where I'm coming from when I'm using the word. Uh, construct is something which is sort of done through a material, abstract, ideological, discursive, economic process. All these things come together and produce constructs. To come all that way, rifle in hand, with 2,000 people marching up my heels, and then to trail feebly away, having done nothing, no, that was impossible. The crowd would laugh at me, and my whole life, every white man's life in the East, was one long struggle not to be laughed at. So, if you look at this particular description, uh, what is told to us quite clearly that being a white man in the East is a neurotic experience. It's one long struggle not to be laughed at. Right? So, basically, uh, you are trying your best uh, to appear powerful, to appear resolute to appear in control, rational, and everything else which are manly, especially for a white man in the, this particular colonized setting. But uh, there are moments of hesitation, there are moments of ambivalence, there are moments of breakdown, nervous breakdown, existential breakdown, etc. But the point remains that your entire life in the East, when you're situated in the colonies, is one long struggle not to be laughed at. So in other words, you should never be called or found out as a fool. Right, you must always be a hero. Now, this compulsion to be a hero all the time, you know, to appear heroic all the time, to appear resolute all the time, to appear military and macho and manly and everything all the time, that paradoxically uh, creates the masculinity crisis in Orwell. You know, because he, he does not want to be that manly, he does not want to be that resolute, he does not want to be that ruthless, that you know, merciless person who goes and shoots elephants just because you know, it had done something. Uh, but you know, he, he has a softer side, he is more affectionate, he's got more of an empathy. But these attributes are clinically curtailed in this kind of setting. Those, these, are, these are disallowed uh, in this setting. And what is encouraged and promoted and produced, in other words, uh, is this uh, you know, resolute sahib, the, the identity, the icon of the resolute sahib, the image of the resolute sahib. In other words, uh, he has to be more of an image and less of a human being. So no one really cares about what kind of human being he is, uh, whether he's nice or bad or soft or kind or cruel, uh, no one's bothered. Uh, the, the real important question is uh, what kind of an image, what kind of an identity is he producing? That becomes the all important question, right? Uh, and the, the, the question of the human being becomes really, really less important in this kind of context, okay? So uh, the, every white man's life in the East is one long struggle not to be laughed at. Now that's quite depressing, it's quite neurotic, right? Because you know, you, you're always nervous of being found out, right? So Owen is nervous of being found out. Uh, when he, when he, he says at some point that, you know, I do not want to shoot the elephant, but I have to. But what if the people find out that I don't want to shoot the elephant? Then they would laugh at me, then they would say this white man is not resolute enough because he doesn't want to shoot the elephant. He's hesitating, he's ambivalent. And it, it, ambivalence is disallowed, it's, not, it's forbidden in this kind of a gendered code, right? So if you're a white man in the East, ambivalence is denied to you. You have to be merciless, you have to be ruthless and you know, non-ambivalent all the time. So he says, this is one long struggle uh, not to appear what I really am, right? To disguise it, to masquerade uh, as a manly Englishman uh, in this kind of a setting, okay? Right. So if you look at this section, uh, he says, uh, 
for, at that moment, with a crowd watching me, I was not afraid in the ordinary sense as I would have been if I had been alone. A white man mustn't be frightened in front of the natives. And so in general, he isn't frightened. The sole thought in my mind was that if anything went wrong, those 2,000 Burmans would see me pursued, caught, trampled on, and reduced to a grinning corpse like the Indian up the hill. And if that happened, it was quite probable that some of them would laugh. That would never do. So he says over here that you, know, you must never appear afraid if you're a white man. So again, look at the very coded kind of behavior that are associated with certain kinds of gender. Right? So not only is he a man, is he's a white man, and the moment he says the word white man, uh, a certain set of codes come in. And he has to abide by those codes. It's very coded. Right? Uh, so there are certain codes of conduct which a white man must follow, must abide by. Uh, you know, doesn't matter what he really wants to do, doesn't matter what he really wants to follow, doesn't matter what he really desires as a human being, what his agency is. So this is where the crisis of agency comes in. The courts become more important than a human will. So conforming to the courts. So he has to conform to the courts as a white man. Uh, and that's a very powerless thing to do, right? That you know you have to conform to the courts all the time. Uh, you, know, you don't have power not to do it. In other words, if you want to make it more paradoxical, you don't have the power not to be powerful, right? You have to be powerful all the time. You have to enact power all the time. You have to be performatively powerful all the time. So the entire idea of not being powerful, the entire idea of not appearing resolute is, you know, is not existing. You know, it's, it doesn't exist right? in this map, this code of conduct. So he says, I wasn't frightened uh, because I'd be killed. I was frightened because you know, they might see me uh, pursued by the elephant and then they would laugh. So just imagine a situation over here where he's actually saying that his own life over here is less important than the image of the manly Englishman that he has to preserve in front of the natives. So this is where this entire idea of extended gender identity becomes far more important and far more preservable than the interior human identity. Right? Because his lack of loss of life, if he dies shooting the elephant, that wouldn't be such a big problem. But if he misses shooting the elephant uh, and the elephant chases him uh, down the hill and everyone sees him running and screaming in fear and everything, that would be a really dangerous thing because then people would know, oh, this is a white man who is afraid of being uh, killed by the elephant. And that is more important. That is something he wants to avoid at any cost. Okay? So, um, and you know, this little section, uh, if you just skip through it, but you know, there's one thing I want you to see. The, he, he shoves the cartridges into the gun and he gets you know, on the road to get a better aim. He's about to shoot the elephant. But this one sentence, the crowd grew very still and a deep, low, happy sigh as the people who see the theater curtain go up at last breathe from innumerable throats. So the, the theater metaphor is very much there now. It's completely nakedly visible. Now, this is an act of theater. So he's an actor uh, of a massive theater, and he has no other choice apart from uh, enacting the role which is pre-inscribed for him. Right? And it's completely replaceable, by the way. Any white man would do. So the man, George Orwell, uh, uh, his idea, his intention, his agency, his emotions are completely irrelevant. Uh, it's the idea of the white man in this setting, uh, which is important. And a white man must behave in just one way. Right? And that code of conduct, which is very theatrical, very excessive, very performative, very spectacular, uh, very larger than life, deliberately designed that way, that becomes very important. And so all the Burmese people around them, they begin, they, they give out the sigh of relief. So the curtains are going up. Uh, and the curtains are going up, the act is about to happen. The elephant is about to be killed. So uh, interestingly, the elephant and Orwell become uh, like two actors on stage. One is about to shoot the elephant, shoot the other, and that's about, uh, about to get shot. But ironically, both are being killed, as you can understand by now. So the man, George Orwell, is sort of symbolically being killed of his agency. So this is a bit of an uh, agentic annihilation, right? The, the annihilation of agency. So his agency is about to die uh, in this very act of shooting the elephant. Okay? So the elephant and Orwell become, in a very interesting way, uh, you know, alter egos to one another. You could do that, so very interesting psychoanalytic reading that way. The Orwell looks at the elephant and sees a projection of his own human self and that uh, is something which uh, really moves them. Right, so 
Uh, so he shoots the elephant and if you read the essay you find the entire uh, process through which the elephant is shot uh, is described in a very decelerated way. So everything slows down, everything is magnified um, and it, it becomes almost very cinematic. We have some sort of very close up details of the elephant's breathing, uh, you know, there's an image of the elephant's vein uh, which is beginning to, beginning to become pink and obviously logically speaking, you know, you can't see, you know, the elephant's vein from that distance. But the entire idea is to give you a more graphic image of the death of the elephant. And interestingly, in, in that section, you find the elephant doesn't really die very, very easily. It, it dies very slowly in a very senile kind of a way. And that's what makes Orwell even more, uh, you know, uneasy. Because you know, if the elephant had died quickly, then it would have been or, or, you know, done and dusted, then he would have just gone back. But he sees the elephant in front of him dying very, very slowly. And he wants to help it, so he keeps shooting it, you know, shot after shot in the gun and that doesn't affect the elephant, it just keeps dying very, very gradually. Uh, so even there, there's a lack of agency. So you know, he wants to shoot the elephant very quickly now and get it over and done with and go away, but uh, it'll just take the normal course. The elephant will die in a, in, in a way in which it normally dies. So it dies a very slow, painful, lingering death. And all Orwell can do is just stand there and watch it die. Uh, and remember, I just mentioned a little while ago that the death of the elephant uh, in front of his eyes is a projection in a certain way. That symbolically is a projection of the death of his own agency and it's not a very happy sight for him uh, to see it happening in front of him. Uh, this, this act of annihilation, sort of essentially shooting himself, uh, his own agentic self in the process of shooting the elephant and he sees it happen uh, in a very slow down process, in a very uh, sort of decelerated process and it's even more painful for him uh, to see that happen in front of him in that fashion. So, uh, and then he goes back to the, the, the colonial club where, um, so you know, just before I come to that, this, this little thing I want you to see, uh, the colonial club uh, was an example of the homosocial space, all male space where the white men met to socialize and entertain themselves apropos of the non-white servants. So the, the entire idea of the colonial club where was initially a homosocial space where women were not allowed to enter and it was sort of a big boys, old boys club like thing where the white men would gather and talk and get drunk uh, and basically converse with each other and preserve the Britishness. Um, and obviously the only Indians allowed in those clubs to be the waiters and bartenders and people who cook for them, uh, what, you know, people who wait on them, the servants, the menial people. Although later that changed, there were more Indians who were allowed entry to the clubs depending on the status, social status, intellectual status, etc. But originally, the colonial club was an all-male homosocial space. It was a very gendered kind of space where women were not allowed at all, initially. Uh, but interestingly, and this is a bit of a digression, but it's a helpful and interesting digression, uh, the colonial club began to allow women to come in. Uh, the British people began to allow the British women to come in in the clubs because uh, that would ensure that they stay protected because, you know, the British men there in the club are drinking and having a merry time, uh, the women would be by themselves in the houses, in the bungalows, uh, and there would be male servants around them and that could potentially be harmful or dangerous or even more complex. So they were allowed, they were brought into the male clubs and so it became a bit of a, uh, you know, um, both genders were allowed. It's not, no longer a homosocial space, but it became a more heterogeneous space. But initially it was a homosocial space, uh, homosocial being, you know, the, that, that one male, one gender space. It could be an all male space, it could be an all female space, etc. So the colonial club over here becomes an important uh, metaphor for the relationship between, looking at the relationship in space and gender, especially in a colonial setting. But just to come back and conclude this essay, so this is what he says when he comes back to the club. Uh, he says, among the Europeans, uh, the opinion was divided. The older men said I was right. The younger men said it was a damn shame to shoot the elephant for killing a coolie because an elephant was worth more than any damn Karingi coolie. And afterwards, I was very glad that this coolie had been killed. It put me legally in the right and it gave me a sufficient pretext for shooting the elephant. Right? So, you know, you can see different orders of commodification over here. Everything is commodified in this culture, right? So the elephant costs more than a coolie. Uh, so you know the young people are saying that you know it's a damn shame for you to shoot the elephant. And why would you, uh, you know, waste a more costly machinery, a more costly commodity uh, for a less expensive commodity? The coolie is a commodity. The elephant is also a commodity. So this is how colonialism worked. And again, this is a very, uh, very naked essay which tells you exactly how colonialism worked uh, in its all naked, brutal machinery. Everything is a commodity over here. 
right? So from the coolie, from the elephant, uh, from language, from the riches, from agriculture, from tea, everything is a commodity. Human beings are commodities, animals are commodities, um, culture is a commodity, etc. So the younger people are saying that, you know, you should not have a uh, waste or a more expensive commodity, a more costly commodity in for, you know, a less expensive one. The older people, however, they are saying uh, that he was, he was right. Uh, and interestingly, you can do a very interesting rich reading of it. One way of looking at it was that he was not really shooting the elephant to avenge the coolie. Uh, he was shooting the elephant to protect uh, the narrative of power that he embodies as a white man. Right? And that is uh, the, the older man, you know, the, the wiser older man know better, that is the more costly commodity. Right? I hope you got the point that he is actually protecting the more expensive narrative of power of supremacy, of you know, hierarchy, uh, of being the white man. That was a narrative he was protecting, right? He, he wasn't really concerned about the coolie when he was shooting the elephant. He was concerned about his identity as a white man. He was concerned about the narrative of power that a white man embodies in a colonial setting. And he was concerned about not looking like a fool, not being laughed at, etc. In other words, he was concerned about looking and appearing like a powerful authoritative person. Right? And that was a narrative he was protecting. And the older men over here say that it was the right thing to do. And an interesting, uh, interesting reading of that would be that the older men are wiser. They spend more time in the colonies. They realize that the narrative of power is the, the most expensive commodity, the, the priceless commodity, the, perhaps the only priceless commodity in colonialism. And that must be protected at any cost. Okay? So uh, that is what he says. And the essay ends with this really magnificent sentence. He says, I often wondered whether any of the others grasped that I had done it solely to avoid looking like a fool. The only reason why I shot the elephant was because I did not want to look like a fool. In other words, I did not want to compromise my gendered identity uh, as a colonial white man, a colonial Sahib in, in Burma. And that was the only reason why I shot the elephant. I couldn't really care less about the coolie. I couldn't really care less about the elephant. I couldn't really care less about anything else. The only thing I really cared about, absolutely, uh, unequivocally at that point of time, was my location as a white man, as a white Sahib, uh, the white you know, police officer in colonial Burma. And I did not want to appear like a fool. And it is looking around in the, in the club, uh, hoping no one got that, no one you know, grasped the real reason why he shot the elephant. So, in other words, the entire essay uh, is a very, uh, is, uh, it's an essay about this very neurotic uh, ability, this very neurotic practice of being performative. Everyone's performing something. You know, you're performing the white man, someone's performing another kind of white person. So, you, are, you, you embody certain military masculinity, you know, someone else is embodying administrative masculinity, uh, someone else is embodying a different kind of femininity. In other words, it's a very coded culture. So, colonial, the relationship between colonialism and gender uh, sort of highlights the very coded nature of gendered formations. Right? Especially how this play out in a political space, in a discursive space, in an ideological space, where uh, relationships between human beings are uneven and unequal. Right? So obviously the Burmese and the British, they don't mix in equal terms away. It's a very unequal relationship. And in this unequal relationship, uh, it becomes even more coded, right? because the stakes are higher. Right? There's more hierarchy. So you know, gendered location, gendered identities become even more, uh, you know, it it's really becomes a really big deal to preserve and protect and promote certain kinds of gendered identities. And you must do it, you must protect it, you must promote it at any cost. So uh, this, this concludes this essay. But just to wind up what we have been talking about in the last couple of lectures, it's a continuation, theoretically speaking, of what we did in shooting the elephant, in, in Munshi Premchand's uh, Shatan Shakilari, and also previously, when I looked at other texts like Twelfth Night, and we looked at the theoretical you know, uh, preamble with which we began this particular course. This is an essay which talks about the constructive quality of gender. How it is constructed to certain very, very heavily defined codes. Right? And how as a human being, if you are to belong, if you are to subscribe to a gender identity, you must conform to the codes. Right? Because if you don't conform to the codes, your entire gender identity will collapse. And then people will question you. People will question your privilege, people will question your power, people will question your authority. So if you are to preserve your privilege, if you are to preserve your power, you must conform to the codes. So the very constructed quality of gender, the very constructed quality of the coded behavior, uh, the colonial coded behavior in shooting an elephant makes it a really rich text uh, for us interested in gender studies today. 
I hope you found this lecture interesting. I hope you found this text interesting. It's a very, very uh, rich text. It's a very complex text, which is studied in different kinds of courses. It's studied in colonialism uh, courses, post-colonial courses. It's studied in, in different kinds of Marxist writing courses. But also, it's one of the very, very uh, heavily anthologized texts uh, in any study of gender, special relationship with gender, power, and politics in, in colonial setting. So, please go through uh, the essay in its entirety because we just studied some selected sections which are the most prominent sections in terms of looking at it from a gender perspective. But there are other sections too which are very, very interesting. So, do go to the entire essay and we'll start with a new text in the subsequent lecture. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'll see you very shortly. Thank you.